This is the Average Guy Network, and you have found Home Gadget Geeks, show number 245, recorded on January 21st, 2016. Here at Home Gadget Geeks, we cover all the favorite tech gadgets. News, reviews, product updates, and conversation, all for the average tech guy. I'm your host, Jim Collison, broadcasting live from the AverageGuy.tv studios here in Bellevue, Nebraska. And we post a show with world-class show notes. And you probably want to start checking out the show notes. There's some good stuff out there. Each week, we post those out at TheAverageGuy.tv. You can also join us live now through our new mobile app that we have available. If you haven't tried this out, go to any of our live pages or go to TheAverageGuy.tv slash subscribe. I've got two buttons for you. There or, the easiest way to do it, go to Home gadgetgeeks.com and you'll see the links for both the android app and the iphone app it's really the easiest way to listen to home gadget geeks on the road we are broadcasting live right now you could be if you were on the road you could be using one of our apps to stream the audio of this live and to get the show no matter what all the recorded versions of home gadget geeks go out there as well so check that out homegadgetgeeks.com and of course home gadget geeks is a part of the geeks network find the links to this show and many other great podcasts including one of my favorite lately is from this guy, Rich Hay, down below there, Windows Observer Podcast. If you really want a condensed version, I like, I, Rich, I say it's a no-nonsense, just the facts, we're not screwing around kind of podcast. Yeah. You want to listen to Windows Observer, it's on the Geeks Network. You can find it at thegeeksnetwork.com. Well, Rich, while I'm talking about you, let me introduce you Rich Hay. He's uh, out there at Windows Observer. He writes for... Win Super Site and your own site as well, and then of course is behind the the Windows Observer podcast. Rich, thank yeah, you. Yeah, Observe Tech podcast. Observe Tech. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a quick uh, forty five minute or so snapshot of the headlines with a little bit of opinion and thought thrown in there. And uh, been a little out of whack the last couple of weeks, yeah. but we got back on track this week. It was a late Tuesday afternoon recording. That was a little weird. I love the morning recordings. I don't know why. I just love that 5.30 a.m. recording on Monday mornings. And you got you always get your coffee, a little sip, and then. Yeah, <laughs> but I learned how to truncate silence. <laughs> it's all good. I, uh, I, I'm i not joking. If you're if you're a regular listener of Home Gadget Geeks and you really want to get, it's 30, 35, right? You're, you're pretty yeah, it usually doesn't go longer than 45 minutes. Yeah, so I can either listen to, to two hours of Windows Weekly, which I still do from time to time, or I can get 30 yeah. minutes of, of, of Rich's, you know, Observe Tech podcast in a, and it's a lot of Windows news. We're going to talk some of it about that tonight. I'm, I have Rich on. He's coming off of some really cool reviews and the first of the year we're going to talk a little bit about microsoft so rich thanks for coming in uh, yep. good to see you again thanks and for then, having me then of course uh, another uh, podcast out there on the geeks network is mike's uh, open mic night and so mike weger welcome to to home gadget geeks yeah i'm glad to be back good to have you i caught uh open mic night last night and uh, surprisingly, not a lot of Apple stuff going on. It was all about PF Sense. What uh, what's going on there? Yeah, we started off the beginning of the show with some Apple news, some Apple headlines, and then I want to talk a little bit about the PF Sense box that I had asked you during a show. Hey, how are you monitoring your up and down on your entire network? And you had told me, hey, it's PF Sense. So I looked around, asked some people for uh, any old towers that they had, built a PF Sense box, and I've been loving it. And so on the show, I just want to bring up just how I still use my Apple Airport Express and Extreme with the PF Sense box, just in a different way. And there's some really cool advanced things you can do in PF Sense with still using the guest network on the router. You can still use that and just tag it as a VLAN and do all sorts of stuff like that. So it related kind of, you know, it was a little bit tied into my Apple Focus podcast, but it's been a really fun project and I've learned a lot. I've been forced to learn a lot. And, uh, Luckily, it's just been some guessing and it works kind of stuff. But a lot of it was Googling and YouTube, and you can just find just about anything nowadays. So, yeah, Mike, I'm also good. seeing some interesting posts from you about some uh, x86 architecture type boxes <laughs> that uh, like. And then I saw something about maybe a certain person like making you look at Windows a little more seriously since you've been on the podcast. What the hell is going on over yeah, there? Yeah, I know. Everyone over on Open Mic Night, all the listeners are very confused. And they all don't like Jim very much. No, they love Jim. Jim was on last week, but uh, it's very known that he's been the guy that's gotten me into Windows. My mother, even like, I was talking to her like a week ago, and she's like, well, I know Jim's been getting you into some Windows stuff. I'm like, first of all, how do you know Jim's name? Like, you don't listen to the show anymore. <laughs> I must have like brought it up at some point. I must talk about you a lot, which is, you know, I don't know what that is. As long as it's not me, in but, your sleep. Or, or, but yeah, okay. right. Right, exactly. But um, yeah, I 
talk about learning, trying to, I had two different boxes that were donated to me um, by actually members of this community and which was awesome. So I grabbed two of those and just learning the difference between, you know, 32 and 64 bit. And I knew the difference generally, but how that affects uh, running certain uh, free BSD stuff on there and trying to find the old versions of free NAS and uh, trying to choose which computer is best for the router and which one is best for the free NAS box. And so just building those two things, it's been a, it's been a great learning process. Let me tell you, especially for someone who has come over from the Apple ecosystem and not really had to worry about that too much, you know, ever since the power uh, PC days and stuff like that. So it's, it's been a lot of fun and I've really enjoyed building it and now it's up and running and I'm monitoring my usage as we talk now. So oh, very cool. I feel like part well, of the I have to tell you for a minute, real quick, I've just gotten why it's called open mic night. <laughs> right. So, that's taken a while. It's oh. definitely not built on comedy. It's built on just me oh. being able to ramble and babble about whatever I want, whenever yeah. I want. And I no, figured it was a name shows. shows. I, I love ever, shows like that. Yeah. And if I ever want to get rid of the Apple stuff, I, the name just can kind of stay because it just is generic to whatever yeah. I want to talk about. So it'll it's grow like and Observe adapt tech. with me as I go. Like Observe Tech, Home Gadget Show. Yeah. Yes. Right. It we grows all with the, the time. So. Although we all kind of rotate around. I think one of the things I've liked about our network is we don't always step on each other. We oh, we overlap in some overlap, cases, yeah. I think. But, uh, but we do it well, and we'll continue to have folks from the network on. I try to have Rich on at least twice a year. He's, a, he's an MVP as well for Microsoft. And so I try to have them on a couple times a year to talk about what we're doing at Microsoft and those kinds yep, of things. Just but, got my seventh renewal on the first of January. Oh, you know, I got to turn my, congratulations, by the Thanks. way. I've got to turn my stats in. It's that yeah. time. I got that note from Carrie and it's yeah, like, we just uh, lost our lead again. I know. I know. Well, anyway, what else is new in Microsoft? Okay. Well, there's a lot speaking of that. There's a lot of stuff new at Microsoft. Let's yep. talk a little bit about the work that you've done recently. I know you've been part of a, the Lumia phone trial and there's been yeah. some stuff going on with that. Can you talk a little bit about that? What yeah, you're doing I got approached um, by Lumia US the handle at Lumia US on Twitter. And it's a, a guy behind it named Peter and was asked if I wanted to be part of this Lumia trials thing. And what they were doing was they were inviting a handful of people. I think they might have invited 20 total. Um, to to actually do a home trial of the Lumia 950 with a continuum dock or the display dock as Microsoft's calling it now. You don't say no to opportunities like that when somebody pings you on Twitter and says, hey, can I send you an email and then offers this. And so jumped in on it, got one of my other fellow MVPs, Sean Keen, um, to participate as my teammate. And they had pairs of us basically. And Every other day during the week, they would send out challenges and they would be to talk about different features and functionality of the 950s, Windows 10 Mobile, the Continuum Dock. And um, so it was a great test because it, it allowed me to really learn, uh, you know, Windows 10 Mobile, all of us, most of us that are running it on some phone, no mobile, Windows 10 Mobile. But to get to research some of the features of the 950s, these high end devices Microsoft released last year, the 950, 950 XL. Um, and so spent about a month doing that, trying different things. I, I told you I did a blab for the first time. We talked for an hour about the, the things. I did four hours in continuum mode on purpose just to see if I could do a morning's worth of work with it. And while it's doable, I probably would pull my hair out by the end of a full day. It, it's because it's just such there's it's great to be able to throw those apps that are compatible up on a full screen from the phone and still use the phone and all that kind of stuff and use a keyboard and a mouse. But it's great technology and it's a great demo of that technology. But it, it, to me, it's kind of like V1, obviously. It's kind of like the, uh, the Windows Hello on the phone. It's neat. It's cool to try out. But once you've tried it, you turn it off and I use a pen, you know. Uh, Windows Hello on the desktop, a little bit different. That thing's yeah. hooked up to my main desktop, and every time I sit down, it logs me in. That's cool. Do you, you think they'll switch? I mean, it's obvious that the the desktop version of Hello is the right way, and the phone is the wrong way. I agree. Phone, but, you got to be way too close. Yeah, I mean, I'm switch? not kidding you. You've got to have it about this far from your <laughs> eye for Stupid. it to pick up your eye. <laughs> yeah. So it's neat technology. I I think it needs it. It's got to go a little bit further. You know, it's got to get reiterated. And you know what? Look at Surface. Look at the Surface line of products. Back to 2013, 2012 when RT came out and then 2013 with Surface Pro. And they've iterated that hardware very well all along the way. And now we're at Surface Pro 4 and Surface Book. And I think they will do that with this technology as well. I, I personally don't think Microsoft's going to stop building hardware of any kind, obviously. And I, don't, I think they're going to continue to build mobile hardware. But 
I think as they go through different variations of this and d different iterations, it'll improve. I mean, just again, look at Pro 4, look at Surface Book and what they've done compared to Surface Pro and Surface, the first one. So in your opinion, Continuum is not ready for prime time for most people? At this point? No, you know, they just released the Universal Windows Platform remote desktop preview, which technically would allow you to connect to a remote desktop server or a system run in regular Windows and actually run x86 Win32 apps on from through your phone through a remote connection. Mm -hmm. So that gives it a little bit more attractiveness, okay? Um, my cohort, Rod Trent on Supersite, uh, he's our now our con uh, conference and con uh, conference and education director. He took his 950 to System Center Universe this week and purely used it as the social media push to a large format monitor that monitored all the System Center Universe hashtag the whole time they were there. So it's got its uses. Like I said, four hours on that bad boy just wore me out. <laughs> and so as more apps come on board, that are compatible with Continuum and can be displayed on the larger monitor, I think that will be better. But there's lag and there's, it, you know, it just, it's a little rough around the edges as you would expect from something that's V1. So do we expect the 950 and the XL to be kind of the sacrificial lambs of this generation of phones? Yeah. And they'll throw them out there and get some feedback and the next generation should be better? Is that? Is I that would think thinking? so. Again, I, I keep going back to Surface with, when it comes to Microsoft and what they did between Surface RT and then what they did Surface Pro, and they learned from each successive cycle and got better and improved things and changed things. Like the speakers, remember on Surface, the speakers were pointing backwards. In fact, I still have my Surface ears to put on the Surface 2 to push the, the even through Surface 2, the speakers were backwards. Mm -hmm. It was finally in Surface 3 that they pushed them forward. The ears, remember the ears? Yeah, the little black ears that yeah. go over the edges and corner. And, and I used to use a recipe book, all right? when we would watch movies on the surface too so now you know so they each time they've learned they listen and they've improved the devices and i suspect that that will be the same thing with these now whether that's you might have seen paul throt's rant today about surface phone i don't know if you saw it on throt.com or not but no he basically said whether there's a surface phone or not that the reality is that no one piece of hardware is going to save windows phone Windows Phone's always going to be a third or fourth place or whatever it is. I don't think Microsoft abandons it because they've put too much investment in the whole, you know, the whole scale. So all the way from Internet of Things, all the way up to the big 83 inch Surface Hub. But they're not going to, to, to be spending a lot of effort and money to try to grow that market. It's just not there. Well, well, you say, you know, so you say it won't save the phone, the Surface Phone won't save the phone market, but when when surface first came out tablets were i mean the microsoft end on tablets were was dead and yet oh it was yeah it has, big time it has completely resurrected it i mean i can't well, believe. And, and i agree but but what's yeah. resurrected it you know they took a big hit for that too a billion dollars yeah true. and they took a big billion dollar hit for nokia too when, from right. the purchase of nokia last year so yeah i i'm with you there's potential there but I don't know. It's kind of hard to see. It's kind of like back in the surface days four years ago to see it, but maybe, I mean, it's feasible that it could happen. I, I don't disagree with you, by the way, Rich. I, I totally agree with you. However, so we put uh, that kangaroo device in Mike Weger's hands. Right, right. And all of a sudden there may be now, and now if we can marry, so if the 950, the next version or two of it can actually be a desktop replacement because that kangaroo is a desktop replacement. It just doesn't have a phone in it. Right. So imagine getting phone capabilities in that in that kangaroo size, doing everything it does. All of a sudden, the phone, it's not about the phone anymore. It's about a compelling device that has a phone in it. Correct. That it's I can about the experience. Do. Yeah. So and and Satya Nadella has could... talked about the portability of the experience being their focus. It's why they're pushing so many apps to iOS and Android. You know, it, and and they're doing this, and, and you can see the typical spin-ups of the Windows Phone fans when this happens, you know, whether it be the iOS selfie app or, you know, what was it today, an alarm app that wants you to play a game in order to turn it off or something for Android from Microsoft Garage. So, you know, everybody on Windows Phone platform is going, okay, we want to love this, we want to do this, but we keep seeing you go to all these... Microsoft's not going to stop doing that. I think that's Satya Nadella's strength is he understands where Balmer before him focused purely Microsoft, you know, stovepipes. It right. didn't much get out of those lanes. 
Satya Nadella has chosen to embrace the fact that people are everywhere and they're everywhere using their products. And I know Mike can probably talk to the fact that the quality of the products on iOS and Android are unreal. I mean, I even wrote about that when I did my six month stint on an Android LG G4, how much better some of the Microsoft apps were on there than they even were on Windows Phone. The, yeah. the authenticator app, the authenticator app on Android, you know, it's a one tap push to authenticate a two factor login anywhere from anywhere to your phone. Well, you may have seen a couple of weeks ago, uh, a Windows store listing sneaked out of an internal beta of an authenticator app for Windows phone, Windows 10 mobile that has those capabilities. So they're coming back to us, don't you know, so they're getting there and you got to think, look at the parade of Windows of universal Windows platform apps that have come out over the last month. Today, Dropbox, I think Rudy Hume built it, and he said they confirmed he's also building a mobile version. It uses Windows Hello, for instance, on the desktop to log you into your files if you want. So yeah, that's Rich the first app I've seen take Windows Hello away from just being a login function and put it to use in the app itself. Some, some security. Rich, you've been covering kind of a, the parade of apps in, yep. in Observe Tech. That's How, right. I, 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 I get this feeling as an observer from the outside looking in that it's picking up speed. And it so is. all of a sudden, so. this, this app gap is closing. Is it closing fast enough, in your opinion? I, I don't know if it's fast enough, if that there's a definition of fast enough, um, because I met, commented to somebody on Twitter because they pointed me to Paul Therott's blog post about what Surface Phone and wanted me to chime in. And, and I agree with Paul that a single piece of hardware is not going to save. The, it's not the, you know, the holy grail to save the platform. It's going to be the apps. Because when I was on the G4, there weren't any apps I couldn't live without, but it was pretty convenient to bank, deposit checks, and do stuff like that right from my phone. Now I'm back on Windows 10 Mobile. I can't do some of those things. Um, but American Express came out with an app. So, you know, it, it's, it's changing. It's moving in that direction. And, and you saw this week, now they're really pushing towards the iOS guys with a new series of blog posts from the development side to show them how easy it is to port an app from iOS into Windows 10 Mobile as a, as a universal Windows platform app. And I think that's where the magic is. Don't worry about Android. Don't worry about Android apps. We're running them in virtual whatever. Get those iOS guys who have already built the apps and have got most of the work done, get them to start coming over to the platform and finding the value there. I think that's what Build's going to focus on. You know, last year they brought up these bridges. We, we're not hearing much about a story anymore, right? The Android one just kind of fell off the face of the earth iOS Project Islandwood is the one getting a lot of attention now. And again, that blog post they did this week was extensive about how to take that app from iOS into Windows 10 Mobile. Yeah, for sure. You mentioned Build. Uh, are you going to Build this year? Did you get a ticket uh, in one minute? It was I, I didn't register. I We're waiting on our press registration to go attend his press. Uh, what he, I am curious, though, it seemed the word was from Steve Guggenheimer that it sold out in one minute. That's what I heard. I heard um, that today. And uh, so obviously either people skipped over the part or didn't read the part about there's no freebies or the people yeah, just want to get there. Now, here's the issue I have. He made a tweet that talked about the sellout and then said, but we will work harder next year to go capacity. Well, last year they sold out in 20 minutes for the same location. Why didn't they make that effort this year? Mm -hmm. I, I know Microsoft's been trimming money everywhere, you know, and, and trying to be frugal, but a lot of people have come to me after writing about that very thing and said, well, after a 20 minute sellout last year, why weren't they looking for more capability and more, you know, throughput for people? They raised the price a hundred dollars this year, actually. And there's no hardware giveaway. And last year's hardware giveaway was equivalent to about $1,200, the Spectre X360. And they say that there will be more in-depth sessions and things of that nature. So I, and when, when is that coming up? Uh, build is the end of March. It like 30 March to 2 April or something like that in San Francisco at the Moscone Center. Oh, very cool. Rich, give us your rundown on Windows 10 and the state of it today. I mean, if you were to kind of summarize where Windows 10 has been and where do you think it's going, give us the first where it's been and then uh, where do you think it's going for, for the average guy? Uh, for, for the average Joe who's out there, you know, with the alerts popping up in their computers, there's a lot of folks that don't want to move. They don't like Microsoft has been pretty heavy handed with the upgrade prompts. And just recently they switched over now to focus on small to medium businesses. It used to be if you were domain joined or, uh, 
you had you could not do it. And if you use a WSUS to update your systems, you won't be doing it anyway. But they're now targeting those small to medium businesses, which is typically 249 seats or lower or computers. So those guys are eligible for the free upgrade. They hit over 200 million active users, which I'm glad they changed the count from installs to active users because active users, I checked with them, is a measurement of the last 30 days. So that means if somebody installed Windows 10 and then backed out, they're not being counted. A lot of people were claiming that those were being counted as upgrades in their numbers. So the active count is a much better measurement, in my opinion, because those are people who are turning on their computers in the last 30 days running Windows 10. Um, today, we got another build. We've now had two builds in eight days since the new year for Windows 10, the Redstone branch. That is the test version for Windows Insider. That's in uh, the fast ring. Right? Huh? That's in the fast ring. That's fast ring, right, fast ring. Uh, which they promised. They've been promising for months. But so far, two and eight days is pretty quick pace. We'll see if we get another one in seven to ten days. And maybe we're starting to form a pattern and not just, you know, happenstance releases. Got one new feature today in Microsoft Edge. And they now you can right click on the arrows forward and back and see your history. And so you can quickly go back to in the in the tab, not in every tab, just that tab itself. Um, and I did a I've done a video today that I've rendered and it's ready to go for tomorrow based on a story I wrote last week about managing favorites in Microsoft Edge. I talked about it on this week's show, but there is actually a very basic way to manage your favorites in Edge even though there's not a formal tool. So that video is going to come out tomorrow on SuperSite for Windows. But Windows 10 for me has been extremely stable. I'm running it on two desktop systems, three desktop systems, uh, two laptops. One is running the Insider build, and then I'm running it on an HP Stream 7. And, of course, I'm running the latest build of Windows 10 Mobile uh, Insider on my 950. So for me, it's been extremely stable, but Windows 10 has been kind of a Jekyll and Hyde for people. There's a wide variety of experiences. If you go look on Twitter, you don't have to look any further than gay ball. Just search for those letters and you will see the amount of stuff that gets thrown his way about people and their systems and what's going on, and what's not working well. So I can't tell you why I'm having a very different experience than others are. Uh, Rod Trent, my again, my cohort from SuperSite, we both have the same piece of hardware, same BIOS, running Windows 10. He has horrible daily experiences. I don't. The only difference between the two is I did clean installs. He's done upgrades. So it, it leaves you kind of throwing your hands up and going, mm -hmm. why is that? Why are there so many variations in this, yeah. in the experience? And I, I don't know why, you know, so many different, what was it? The first count was uh, the 30 day count they did for us, 75 million installs, I think at 30 days, because it was 14 million after 24 hours, 75 at the end of the first month. 90,000 different configurations. Mm -hmm. It's not like an Apple. It's not like a Mac. Okay. Those things are pretty standard hardware, right? Yeah. In yeah. the PC world, I mean, one of mine is a beige box. I built it myself, you know? So I've got two, three systems in this house, desktop systems that I built. So the variation with Windows has always been that way, though. Problem is you got to get the hardware guys, the OEMs to keep up to speed with the drivers and things of that nature. Some of the more recent hardware is going to be much better in that way. HP kind of led the way last year with the Spectre. All those drivers are on Windows Update instead of having to go to their site to get them. So if more OEMs do that, and as you watch CES, I'm sure you saw all the different kind of stuff we're seeing. Think about the difference. What Windows 10 has done, it's driven innovation when it comes to computers. And we're seeing so many cool form factors, the improvements on previous form factors. Uh, even HP upgraded the Spectre to a 15-inch screen. Uh, the Yoga 900, Rod Trent can't say enough about that. So, you know, it's driven some innovation in the OEM world. And these aren't just little plastic clamshell systems. We're talking about machined aluminum, very nice hardware that goes along with the performance. So, and you saw the news, uh, what was it, earlier this week, Microsoft's going to stop supporting the old silicone for Windows 10 at some point. So, you know, how many businesses have you dealt with who's running on, you know, stuff that used to run Vista? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I know at Best Buy, that's what I saw all the time. <laughs> yeah. People would come in and say, you know, I've been running this Vista system for 10 years or right. seven system, whatever it is. And I could not convince them to upgrade 
because uh, and they didn't understand the amount of performance improvement they would get over that so as hardware improves i think windows 10 loves the new stuff works pretty good on the older stuff i just got a call this week from from somebody who found mike who somebody found you and me and i think they found you they were looking for you and so i called her back to see what she wanted she's still running windows xp Oh. And so I was, yeah, I was like, so what's keeping you from upgrading? I mean, I can get you a Windows 10 box for 99 bucks. So, yeah. you know, what's keeping you from upgrading? But Mike, speaking of 99 bucks, how is, as we think of the Windows 10 experience, you're coming at it fresh. What has been your experience with Windows 10 over the last three or four weeks? Well, I think that's kind of hard to, yeah, I mean, coming in fresh is the great way to describe it because I didn't really have much experience with Windows before this besides in the work environment, which is extremely limited. But coming in as a as a new user, it's been relatively easy to switch over, easy to find things. Uh, the existence of Cortana in the computer has been a great help to a new user, you know, to asking her to open some preferences. And I just say generally what I'm trying to do, and hopefully she gets it, and she usually does. Uh, there haven't been too many bugs with it. Uh, like I said, running it on the Kangaroo, so it's been running on a $99 PC and it's been fantastic. We have it set up in our living room right now, right now still as our uh, home search machine. We get on there, we turn on the TV and we go to Zillow and we look for houses. That's been our, that's what the machine is being used for right now. And it works perfectly for that. For something in the living room, um, it has no problem with the big screen. I found it to be pretty, pretty flawless so far. I haven't had too many bugs. Uh, I haven't been using too many different apps in the sense of like, I don't, I stick to mainly the browser, Microsoft Word, email, those sort of things. So my experience is still a little bit limited. I haven't tried to run any of the, you know, the Adobe suite or anything like that. I haven't done too much editing. I've done a little bit of audio editing on it, and that's been pretty well. I did that with Audacity, and it worked pretty well. So besides anything else, um, it's been pretty nice, I have to say. And and that's this is the Apple guy talking. This is the Apple fanboy saying that Windows 10 works pretty well. So what's the specs on that thing? You know, I have it's to. An, I always have to look them up. I can never remember. Do you know, it's an Atom you're... processor. It's two gig of RAM, and it's a thirty-two gig hard drive, basically. So, right along the lines of Surface Two. Yeah, well, Surface yeah, Two had four gigs. So, but the two's a, the two's a little light. We asked the guys. We interviewed the guys from Kangaroo and said, mm-hmm. "Why two? You know, and they're like, "Well, that's that's where we started." And they're they're thinking of upgrading some models or providing mm-hmm. some models that have four in it, but. But you quickly realize using something like the HP Stream 7 or some of these, you know, tablets that are a couple years old that came out with 8.1, that it doesn't take much more than two gig for the kind of functionality you typically get out of a machine like that or a device like that, right? So loading up a machine with that with a bunch of RAM, I mean, yeah, four would probably be good. Anything more than four would kind of be a waste when you're uh, limited on other, you have bottlenecks other places besides. Exactly, exactly. Four, probably four would be the, kind of max you right know. i mean i got 16 gig of my main desktop but that's because that's I run what i have too i run 16 stuff. in my iMac so yeah oh so brian says uh it's a limit uh for the free os for microsoft the two gig so if you go above two ah, gig, okay that, good point, does good that point. Start? Yeah, th- but i i also thought that was tied to the screen size too that they weren't I'm licensed sure. under eight inches or something but yeah, it may well, be a combination I, of the two yeah or a price point somewhere in there and getting manufactured mike one of the things i want you to try this week and report back next week is a uh, pluto p-l-u-t-o dot tv on the on the kangaroo it's it's kind of like they got all they've got about 60 channels out there all kinds of different things you can watch i'm interested to see you know, it doesn't have Media Center on it and blah, 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 blah. But Pluto.tv is one of these sites I found that looks very, very close to what you would get in your cable, you through your cable box or through your, your uh, you know, your satellite dish. Um, and it's all streamed like like via YouTube, which is kind of cool. So really give that a shot, Mike. And if okay. you're listening to this, I'd be interested in you guys. Uh, 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 um, Bill Conrad, who is a uh, another podcaster in our community turned this turned me on to this the other day and i'm like this is really good and it's actually really functional which is kind of crazy so pluto.tv give that a try let us know mike report back rich we yeah, have a question to try. we have a question for you from uh, ken he yep. says uh, can you speak to why a clean install matters i was under the impression that an upgraded uh, that the upgrade essentially was a clean install of the base os and, and it is. Uh, and in fact, I was one of the ones very early on in the whole Windows 10 thing that talked about, hey, guys, quit thinking you got a clean install. 
and you know choosing the right options during that upgrade process basically cleans out everything brings it into a new setting however i think the issue arises with the import process so because when you do an upgrade on windows 10 and this existed in 8.1 as well it stores the old version of windows in a directory called windows.old and then it creates a new windows installation and then it imports your apps settings files and programs not desktop programs at the time it was apps only into your new setup so if anything if there's a hiccup during that import process if anything was corrupted beforehand it's feasible that that corruption or that hiccup is going to come into the new laydown the new os that you're putting in so when i chose to hit every one of my systems with a fresh install and when i say fresh install i mean no data no imports no, no i i picked that remove the partition and make this thing a brand new clean install and i i'm not kidding you my experience with windows 10 since that time frame has been almost immaculate again every version of windows you always had your hiccups you always had your little quirks and things that happen you just reboot and you keep moving forward but you hear some of the stories out there like i said rod some of the horror stories rod has told me about his own experience with windows 10 blue screens i hardly knock on wood i hardly see a blue screen on any one of my systems am i using them differently maybe i although i think i work a system pretty hard especially my main desktop and my laptop my primary laptop so i i think it has to do with that import process and if any one little element gets trashed think about it if the registry ever gets trashed on an install that's the brains of your system so by not bringing in the data i it just maybe that's made the difference i don't know that's the only thing that's really different though i've been a big fan of just blowing that thing away and starting from scratch every possible chance i get i just i i don't know what it is uh, in the last couple of years it's just always been cleaner for me to, yeah. to go with a clean, fresh install and make it work that way. Not everybody can do that. Mike did on the kangaroo. You haven't re, you haven't uh, had to restore that at all. Have you that? No, that's no restore mind. process in there. But what I was going to say is on the Mac side too, I fully suggest a nuke and pave method, um, especially if you have done a few upgrades on your Mac side through the different OS's yeah. do a nuke and pave. I did it when I, a good time to do it is when you're switching over to an SSD. So if you need any computer that needs to be upgraded to an SSD, just do the nuke and pave. You'll be surprised when you go to prep for it, how much of your stuff is in the cloud yeah. and how much is in Dropbox and things like that that you won't need. Or, you know, now with the addition of photos for Apple, if you take a photo on any of your Apple products, or anything that's in your photos library, that's all in the cloud and backed up. So you don't even need to back up the photos. Once you bring that down and you'll sign in, it'll download them all again. So just, I, I fully suggest on the Mac side, Mac, I think is even, I don't know, I guess I haven't done it with Windows, but I think Mac has a worse reputation for the cruft that's left over from those operating mm -hmm. systems. And uh, and one way you can do it on a Mac, if you don't want to do a, a clean install, just boot into safe mode every once in a while on the Mac. And that resets a lot of the caches and okay. does a lot of stuff that uh, might help you out if you don't do nuke and paves. So mm -hmm. I boot into safe mode about once or twice every six months just to kind of reset some things. And it just cleans up the Mac a lot with that old stuff. So gotcha. What? You have to do stuff with a Mac? I thought that just, <laughs> I, I thought, thought they, I think they were perfect. shocking. I know. <laughs> No, That's their funny. goal is to make you not think that. And oh, my computer's <laughs> shot. I need to go buy a new two thousand dollar laptop. They've done a pretty so. good job of it. Let, yeah, me, let me tell you, they've done a pretty good job. Ken follows up with that question, Rich. So, this idea: does the importer take it from the Windows old folder? The reason I ask is I'm wondering if there's any issue with rolling back to the original upgraded OS um, if it essentially bypasses the import, then it should work flawlessly. Any thoughts on that? Um, well, here's the thing. Um, it does do the import from the windows.old folder because that's where all your old data is. So your, your document directory, your settings, your apps, whatever information you had on your previous install. Uh, now, one thing Microsoft has really done well since 8.1 and it's gotten even better with Windows 10 is the rollback process, whether it be an abort something went wrong and the installation failed almost I, I don't remember once that I've never gotten back to the original system without any issues um, so the rollback process because all the rollback process is doing is basically restoring that windows.old folder to its former spot so it's going to be exactly what you had there to begin with the import process I think again 
let's say you've got a bad sector on a hard drive and it happens to hit that at the right time. Again, I don't, I can't guarantee this is why, but when I do a clean install, I don't have an import. I'm getting a fresh, clean image from Windows 10. And you can do, there's the, uh, when you do the reset in Windows 10 in settings, there's an option to just leave everything behind and, and get yourself a clean. And it will basically take whatever image is on the hard drive and lay that down as the clean image. Windows old will be gone. There won't be a Windows old. Um, and so I think the risky part of this whole upgrade process is that import because there's just so many things that could go wrong. I think it's a good time to get your, like Mike said, get your data to the cloud, yep. get it backed up, get, get it identified and in the right place start over. I just, yep. I can't, I, agree. I can't emphasize that enough. And Are I've we... now done that for four or five months. And again, it, knock on wood, I'll keep knocking on wood because, but it's run very well. Windows 10 has run well across multiple systems. And Rich, your advice on Windows 10 on an upgrade. So we still have a lot of Windows 7 users who've been waiting. And I've been telling people to wait, actually. <laughs> most people are like, hey, when do we upgrade? I'm like, don't be in a hurry. There's not a lot of features in Windows 10 that most people are going to take advantage of right away yeah. on old hardware, right? Right. It's just one of those kinds of things. Like, just wait. If you want to get the upgrade, give them some time to get the driver set in. But from an upgrade perspective, do we still have the recommendation that you upgrade to Windows 10, you do the upgrade first, you capture that 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 number, right? That yeah, they call the, it a this, digital entitlement. You, you get that locked in, and then you can blow it away at that point, do a fresh install, bring it back in, and then it will automatically authenticate, and you'll get the 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 Windows genuine authentication. Yeah, stuff right. It, it, it still does that. However, with the release last November or the November update, you can now use your Windows Seven and Windows Eight serial product keys to activate a Windows 10 install on hardware. And then it will gain the digital entitlement as well. So there's that wasn't present there when it released on 29 July. And a lot of people were going, well, why not? Well, it took them till November, but they did add that option. So you could do it either way. Windows 7 or Windows 8.1, by doing the upgrade, you it logs and creates a digital entitlement in the cloud that Microsoft stores associated with your account so that it can use it in the future for that piece of hardware. So it's you that will allow you to to be valid. It'll be activated. It'll be genuine. Um, but now with the option to use these Windows 7 and Windows 8.18 8 keys, it's kind of a nice option that if you chose that you didn't want to go through the upgrade first because that was the magic. After 29 July until the November update came out, if you didn't upgrade from your previous OS, you didn't get activated. And so many people were so used to Windows in past, right? I'm just going to nuke it and I'm going to install the new ISO and now I don't have a serial key and it don't, won't activate. And now I'm on a 30 tr day trial basically. Mm -hmm. So Microsoft heard that feedback, I think. And then in the November update, introduced that option. So either way now we'll get you that digital and time and your activation. Yeah. And that's, that's important. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah. Very so important. Here's my, here's my question for you guys being new to the windows space. So I got these two old boxes. One of them is actually not too old has had windows seven on it and it has the key there. And since I'm not using windows on it, since I just ran free as free BSD and put PF sense on it. Can I take that key and plug it into, let's say run a virtual box on my Mac and plug it in as a key to get windows seven. If that's an OEM box, like a Dell or an HP or something like that, yeah. it's tied to the hardware and it's probably coded in the BIOS with Windows 7. Okay, that's what I was wondering. Good to know. Yeah, yeah and, and the way Microsoft, especially Windows licensings work is it's always tied to the hardware yep. in a lot of OEM cases. Is, yeah, you can buy, now, I mean, if you, you walk out and buy a commercial, if I go out and buy Windows 10 on July 30th this year and I have a disk or a digital download, that's a commercial purchase. I can install that on any box I want as long as I'm not running it on another device. It's only allowed to run on one. But when it's an OEM piece of hardware, so like an HP, Dell, or whatever, that key is stuck to that piece of hardware. So if I went out and bought uh, Windows 10 to use in a virtual machine on my Mac, is that then tied to that to this hardware that I'm running on a Mac? Would it be tied to that virtual machine on the Mac? So if I want, if in the future about, I wanted to move it over? Yeah, when you get into virtual machines and licenses, it's a little weird. It gets a little different sometimes. Okay. And, and I'm not going to sit here and say I know 100% for sure that that's legal, licensing-wise, because you can technically have an activated version of Windows and it's still not legal, it's still not genuine. Oh, really? There's ways okay. to get around things, yeah. So I, I can't sit here and say 100% for sure, but as I think, 
the Mac OS is a is a valid host system, you know, for a VM of Windows 10. Okay. And so it may be very because right now people are running Insider on Macs, right? right. Either in parallels or in a VM. So yeah, parallels, yeah. But VMs at VM adds a little bit of weirdness to licensing. So you have to be careful. And and I just can't give a hundred percent for sure. Will it work? Probably. Whether it will. It's it like will. I can technically get the Mac OS, right? Right. And, and I can do a Hackintosh, but that's not legal. See, this should be my area of expertise. I'm, <laughs> I'm the aspiring lawyer, but don't, uh, don't I got you. But you, stuff. if you don't, there's a guy on Twitter that if you ever wanted to keep up with licensing kind of cool discussions, his, uh, his handle is get wired G E T W I R D. His name is Wes Miller. He teaches this stuff. He travels. He was just in Orlando this past week doing licensing stuff. So he's a guy who's constantly talking about licensing amongst many other subjects. So he's a great follow. And um, he is very responsive to questions about licensing. Great. Ken, I'm Ken, following uh, <laughs> Ken, uh, Rich, uh, Ken also asks, so would you recommend people lock in their Windows 10 upgrade now, knowing that the rollback feature is rock solid? I would. I, I, and like you said, you know, you're telling people on Windows 7 there's no rush whether it be hardware or whether it be uh, functionality, because although Windows 10 under the hood has tremendous improvements compared to Windows 7 from a security standpoint, some of those are tied to hardware. So you got to have the, either the Windows Hello camera, a $12 fingerprint reader works with Windows Hello, you know? So I would definitely lock in my free upgrade before 29 July of this year. That way it's done. And it's, it's entitled to that system and you're squared away. Now that means, you know, there was a lot of talk about the way that Microsoft worded the upgrade, right? They said for the life of that hardware, that system, because most of the time, if you replace a hard drive, it's not going to trigger reactivation. If you replace a graphics card, it's not going to trigger reactivation. Change a motherboard or CPU might trigger activation. That therefore is no longer the same hardware. Therefore, you're now on the hook for and that freaked people out too. People, because again, think back to Windows 7 or what was the last upgrade they passed out just like willy nilly? I know they never gave one away free. Um, it was some, maybe it was something to do. Seven, there, remember, there were just so many copies of Windows 7 given yeah. away. Yep. And people thought that's what they did with Windows 10. Mm -hmm. And it's a whole new world when it comes to digital delivery, right? Mm -hmm. I'm sending it to you over the cloud or through an ISO download. You create installation media, but. I'm letting you upgrade a previous valid, genuine installation to get that Windows 10 privilege. The moment you change that hardware, you might be able to reactivate the Windows 7 or the previous OS, but you won't have the free upgrade to Windows 10 after 29 July. So you'd have to go out and buy it. I'd say if you've got hardware now that's eligible for the upgrade, upgrade it this year before 29 July to have the freebie and then go from there. Yeah, and so I think this ties, Mark had a question, what part of the hardware is it tied to for a home-built yeah. system? Is it tied it, to the hard drive? Motherboard mostly, right? Motherboard and chip. I, I would say motherboard is probably the biggest item yeah. because that's the brains uh, that ties it all together. I've changed plenty of hard drives on computers and never been prompted to reactivate. I've changed uh, graphics cards, added memory, never had any of those trigger. Now, I've never, and I've built brand new systems, but that's a whole different ball of wax. But I've never had those individual elements trigger, but motherboard does. So the moment it's a whole new brain and the CPU, I think that's the biggest trigger. But it could very well be a combination of things. But and Microsoft doesn't come out publicly and tell us what those things yeah, are. No, they're not going to. Uh, but don't forget, if you get in a situation and you're you're doing this and things don't work, you can call Microsoft. There, There's a licensing support line. You can actually get through to a real person, and they'll walk you through if it's They'll, sometimes they'll do a manual reset of that and give you a new key. Yeah. Uh, with Windows 7 and 8.1, they had an automated system practically. And you only had to, you put in a code that appeared on your screen. You called the number in your local country, wherever you're at. You inputted this very long, like 24 digit set of five numbers each. I don't know. And it would say, well, how many systems is this running on? And you'd say none. And then it would give you a code to put in five letter groups until you, and it would reactivate. So, I, right now with Windows 10, most of the people I've talked to are getting live people like you said. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, a lot of people are being told, oh, well, tough luck, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. So Windows 10, it, if you think Windows 10 is a whole new ball of wax when it comes to activation, when it comes to being genuine, 
when it comes to how they're licensed and how you got that privilege or that opportunity to upgrade to Windows 10. So it's introducing a lot of differences when it comes to this for Microsoft. So I think they're even playing catch up with the, the whole support side of it and how they, you know, initially with Windows 7, if I remember Windows 7 was the first one to have activation, right? Mm -hmm. And it was not with the original release. I think it came with the first service pack. It came later, yeah. Yeah, it was still a very manual process talking to a person in those days. And eventually about four or five years later became an automated system. I mean, I even discovered at one point that if it was longer than six months since I, because I was, Mike, I was installing Windows 7 every six months clean. That was my kind of nature. And you'd have to call and do the activation. But after six months, it wouldn't even prompt for it. So it's kind of like it looked like things were washed out of the system within six months and it didn't know you were there. It was kind of weird, but you never yeah. know. I, you it's know, never it's been a business. business. It's not yeah. the, it's no science. Exactly. No. So I it would definitely not. get the freebie, make sure you're entitled to it and you've got that squared away and then go forward from there. Yeah, and on the Mac different. side, when you're doing a nuke and pave, just be really careful if you have super old hardware. So I, I'm running into this issue right now. I'm fixing my sister-in-law's computer. It's so old that she doesn't have the Mac store or sorry, the, Mac, the app store. So she cannot upgrade through that and try. If you don't have a CD, she got this computer secondhand. If you don't have an installation CD, they don't even carry it in the Apple stores. You cannot go to an Apple store and say, hey, I need get an the latest version before the App Store came out. And if you don't have that, you are completely out of luck. You have no way to install. And if her hardware can't run the newest stuff, I can't even download it on my computer and right. port it over there. So the so only way on the Mac... Hardware, to, though? How old is that hardware you're talking about? 2005, maybe. That's 11 years ten, old. Time to upgrade. Yeah, You'd be amazed old. at what you get for performance. Yeah, well, we're we're gonna throw in a we're gonna throw in a well, maybe it's 2006 or seven. I okay. can't remember what, but she she missed the boat, is what I mean. So she didn't upgrade fast enough. She so her hardware technically could run it, I believe. Okay, uh, but it's just a weird wonky issue. So we're just gonna do a clone over to an SSD and hope for the best that there's not right. a, a lot of cruft back there. But in that case too, she's not upgrading through the operating system. So technically there shouldn't be any cruft. She just is extremely limited on what she can run on it. So, right. Wow. Wow. Uh, again, that should just work, Mike. I don't, I don't know why it's an apple. It should just, yeah. right? it should just <laughs> work. I don't understand. That's what we've been told. That's, uh, right. that's all I know on the Windows side. Your stuff they, doesn't work. <laughs> our stuff works. Yeah, we just, That's there's this, it's, it's called this little button. You just power it on and it just boop. It does our, and it, it writes my law school papers for me. Mac oh God, stuff is oh. fantastic now. It's Steve fantastic. Jobs comes back from the dead. He actually does the reinstall for you, those kinds of things. So it's magical. Well, hey, let's. Um, hey, speaking I, of Apple and Mac stuff, I got to chime in here real quick. February 2nd, I'm going to hear Waz talk at oh, cool. University of North Florida. He's a great guy. He's doing a speaking He's session. Crazy. One of their, one of their touring great. speaking sessions. Yeah. So I'm really looking forward to that. I'm really looking forward to hearing him talk and see what he has to say. It, it'll be good. I saw him. He came to Omaha a couple of years ago, and I got a chance to see him and meet him, and it was really cool. And so he got up there to start speaking and said, well, I was born, right? And an hour and 15 minutes later, he was in high school. Wow. And like, yeah. And then he, he goes, verbose. yeah. So we're all sitting there uh, kind of looking at our watches. And I think at one point he realized he had gone a long time. <laughs> and he goes, oh, how, how much longer do I have here? And he was only scheduled he to speak like an hour ago, minutes, right? right? And the, the the host goes, "Oh, go another forty five. <laughs> <laughs> he went another hour and fifteen, and, wow. and got through. But he's, you know, he, the interesting parts of his story are about the squawk box and the Captain Crunch whistle and the, you know, those early days of phone freaking, yeah. which was the original hacking, right? I mean, that when was we what think they did, yeah. Hacking, yeah, that's the original kind of the original hacking. And so it's super interesting. I, all cool. two and a half. I'm looking forward to hours. it. Yeah, it's going to be great. Waz, Waz is a good guy. He's just a little crazy. Just be careful. <laughs> Let's uh, speaking of crazy. You got a band. Uh, I got a band. We got them the same yeah. weekend, and we're both on version two. I haven't seen a lot of movement, to be honest with you. We've had one update, I think, or maybe one and a minor yeah. update in there somewhere. Um, I kind of get the feeling. I mean, they're working on this thing, but Rich, with the band two, do you feel like they're giving it priority, and that we're going to get some more stuff to it, or you get that feeling it's kind of we're going to set it and forget it and let this thing kind of roll. Band 2 falls under the Xbox division now. Uh, it's all part of the same division. So there's been so much work on Xbox getting it to the Windows 10 One Core, which came out last November. And they just cranked back up 
updates for the preview program. Uh, in fact, I had one yesterday, about 450 megabytes. that's going to start to introduce a whole bunch of new features, bring some stuff back. Preview on the Xbox? Yeah, Xbox One preview program. I need to get into that. I had no idea that existed. Yeah, now I don't know about signups for that because they had closed it off for a while last fall oh. as they were getting ready to transition the preview program to the One Core, the Windows 10 Core. And right. they it may be open back up again. If you if you stick me on live, I'm at WinOBS on Xbox Live, I'll try to invite you. I've still had that ability within their app to invite people. So I'll give it That'd a shot fantastic. if anybody out there wants to join uh, just add me on uh, Xbox Live at WinOBS, same as my Twitter handle, and I'll pick it up and I'll throw you in there and see what happens. Um, but I know of a couple people who haven't even gotten invites, so maybe they're going to crank it back up. But So I think Band, um, since they're now under that umbrella with Xbox One and that team, which is all part of Windows and Devices Group now, right? That's one great big organization um, under Terry Meyerson. I'm not sure we've had one firmware update for Band since it came out in late November or no, late October, because right. Summit was the first week in November and we had our Band 2s at Summit. And we've gotten that one update. There's not been a whole lot of uh, functionality update. Well, we did get, yeah, that one update yeah, brought no, some, neat some little features. Yeah, you right? get some time. You can control your music from the watch. Yeah, they can you finally, can finally prompt you to stand up and walk around if you've been idle for X amount of time. So. Yeah. That was a nice um, upgrade. I mean, I it agree. was a nice update. And music I thought, control. Oh, cool. They added right. music control. Music they control. added the get up and walk thing and a couple other little features. But no, you're right. With band one, they were they were moving through updates pretty quick with band one, at least once a month. And we now this has been out for at least two months, maybe three, November, December, January. And we only seen one update. Yeah. Well, I just was wondering what you were thinking on that. I hasn't changed my opinion of it. I love wearing it. Oh, it's I enjoy it. It's, Have it's you seen the images on Twitter, though? I saw one guy tweeted me a picture that the band is separating about oh. a half an inch away from the screen. Uh, there's a that's uh, that may be where the electronics end. I don't know, but um, he's got a split in the skin at that point. And so we're talking the second about or third this person. Yeah, we're right, talking right about there. a little bit to the left of the screen. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah on either side. No, nothing for me yet. And it's a daily, I wear it daily. In fact, I need to, I'm trying to get in the habit because the battery life is so terrible. Um, I'm trying to get in the habit of uh, locking this thing every night I come sit down at my desk. Yeah. That's... Locking this to the charger, Let setting me, uh... it here for an hour and then putting it back on when I'm done. And I keep forgetting to put it back on. So yeah, like... I do that too, because I work at home like you. So I'm at my desk. There's, I put it on the charger and leave it there. Hang on a minute. Let me grab something. Okay. Well, Rich is gone. One of the things I wish, Mike, they had done on this band is put, you know, there's part of the batteries in here. And I wish they had, in this part of the, in that part of it right there, I wish they'd have made like a, where you could pull the battery in and out and have two batteries. So yeah. you could slide one in, go all day. Well, even if that kind of stuff makes so much more sense when you have a, a a watch, something that you travel with, something that you have with you all of the time, just like a phone. And I'm never going to get that with Apple, so I might as well stop wishing for it. But you <laughs> might actually get something cool like that. <laughs> yeah, baby. This Rich, is the um, uh, the band stand that Microsoft Store is selling. Uh, it costs twenty dollars, but it integrates your charging cable, and it it has a nice uh, little hook there. Let me see if I can show that. Yeah, so you can see that the band is there, and it's kind of cool the way it. It, you just slide your the sensors in, you hit the charger, and it sits there and charges like that. And so, how much? Twenty bucks. Oh, that's not bad. Maybe I'll pick Microsoft one up. Store. And uh, yeah, well, it sit on the it just sit on the thing overnight. Well, I, that's I what it does it. for me. I don't use it for sleep monitoring anymore because <laughs> I just I find that it bugs me to all get out when I sleep. Um, but I've got to tell you, they improved the detection of sleep, so it. Now, it used to never pick up sleep if you didn't tell it to, but now if you fall asleep and you didn't turn it on to sleep, it will find you. It will figure out that you slept. So th it's definitely big improvements over the old one, over uh, band one. And it's a great workout device. I've been putting it through its paces on stairs and on the bike and on running, and and I've just really liked it from a performance, yep. fitness, tracker steps. We were in San Diego, my son was graduating from Marine Boot Camp last week, the reason we didn't have a show last week. And, and uh, as we're walking around the base, I realized, man, I put 15,000 steps on that. You forget, you know, you park, and then it's a military base. So you really don't drive around a lot. We kind of walked everywhere. 
and 15,000 steps in a day. And, you, you know, that thing buzzed at 10 and you're like, oh, man, I, that's, you know, by one o'clock, I was at 10,000 already. So yeah. that piece works really, really well on the band. Um, the stopwatch, the stopwatch functionality, the lapping functionality, not as great as my Garmin. The Garmin did that stuff excellent and very, very well and tracked it very well. So I think they've got some improvements they need to make in some of those areas. But yeah. I, I was just hoping we would see monthly, kind of some monthly. Here yeah, we got we're it. not seeing that with that. So it kind of like puts it on a back burner. Rod has, Rod does a lot with band. He tracks its accuracy on a treadmill and running and compares it to other yeah. devices and stuff like that. So he, he is our guru and our fitness nut when it comes to that stuff. And uh, in fact, next week in Fort Lauderdale is the big wearables tech expo. Um, it's a four day event down there. So that it'll be interesting to see. I know we had CES a couple of weeks ago, but there may be some very specific stuff coming out of the wearables tech expo that because was it today? I saw a story that said, we got to go beyond the steps when it comes to all these wearables and how do we get there? So some of them have that capability, but yeah. you know, where does it go from there? Yeah. I really hope that Apple takes a page out of Microsoft's book and, and learns a lot from their first wearable. So you, Jim, you talked about it, all the things that were upgraded from band one to band two and the reasons you waited. Now, all the rumors are starting to come out for the Apple Watch 2. It's going to be released in, in March or April. And I, as I look at it, you know, so I just got the first one and they're hardware wise. The only thing I want is a bigger battery. And maybe I would like a change of form factor because when you look at this thing, as it sits on the top, I, there's no curve to that. You see yeah. these little corners right here and the one band right there. Yeah, one band, yeah. Band, no kidding. <laughs> that causes movement. Things can get, things get stuck in here. I catch my zipper in between here all the time just because, and you can't get rid of it. There's no real way to um, get rid of that. So there's some form factor things that I want to change. But as far as that goes for like, I don't want a camera. I don't want cellular radios because of the battery life drain on both of those. I wouldn't use them. So battery life and a change in form factor, everything else they can pretty much do with software upgrades. Now, barring any, you know, adding more power behind or the or watch. As in pro stuff. Yeah. Right. And stuff like that. But even the sensors are pretty good on this thing. As we, you talked about going beyond steps. I don't even, I've, I've never counted steps. Uh, it kind of gives you these circles. Oh. Right. The circles. Yeah, so the circles are how it's not going to wake up. The circles are how it monitors stuff. So you've got exercise, you've got how many hours you stood during the day and stuff like that. So kind of a nice way to measure things. And it's kind of cool because it knows with the heartbeat sensor, okay, this is when he's exercising compared to just, you know, walking around. So, and I know the band does a lot of that stuff too, yeah. but I'm kind of starting to get into those analytics and really like it. But I just hope that form factor wise, I really, and Apple will, Apple's all about clean, sleek looks and stuff like that. But what I'm worried about is that they're just going to add some stuff, like some some gimmicky things and not change the form factor too much. And I think that's really the the one big improvement that the Apple Watch needed. This thing looks like a nerd watch. Like you can tell, right? It's square. It's bulky. It's it, I mean, it's big. You can tell it is a, it, it's not a normal watch. Whereas a lot of those gear watches and stuff like that, they look fantastic because they look traditional. They're that circle. They yeah. You couldn't even tell if you wanted to, which I... I there's good pros and cons to both, but I kind of like the more traditional circular face. But overall, I mean, just being able to, my wife and I were driving around and again, the whole house search thing, this is affecting every aspect of our life. We were trying to do some quick math, right? Okay, what's what's a percentage of a huge number for like down payments and stuff? So as I'm driving, I just activate uh, Siri, I won't say it, but I activated Siri with my voice and asked her to do a quick math equation and it popped up right on my watch. And I was just able to, you know, as we're driving, just do some simple math stuff without having to get out a calculator. So simple things like that. That's why I don't think the Apple Watch needs too much improvement as far as, you know, microphone speakers, it already has that, but man, the band too has it nailed on form factor. Yeah. And, and you hit it on the head. It's about the data behind it. It's that's where you go beyond the steps. Most of us right. use these trackers for basic info, like the number of steps we took today. But when you dive into the Microsoft health app or the health dashboard online, the amount of information that they have about your activity and what you're doing, if you're doing all these different things is unreal and could really be put to good use but you've got to dive into it and you've got to start exploring and you got to just can't say, Hey, I did uh, 1,562 steps today. Right. Yeah. It, yeah. it actually needs to tell me, Hey, fat bastard, get up and start <laughs> walking. Right. And That's they need to it. warn people about backing up your data from these trackers. So uh, kind of a horror story from an Apple user. She was, so these things sync obviously to your phone, right? And it stores it yep. in the health kit in your iPhone. 
Well, if you back up your iPhone, now not many people do this. Most people do iCloud backups, which there's no problem with that. An iCloud backup is encrypted. But when you do a traditional backup to your computer, if you plug in with the lightning cable backup to iTunes, by default, that is not encrypted. You have to check one more box for encryption. Mm -hmm. uh, so in HealthKit has to be encrypted. If you back up with a non-encrypted backup, that stuff does not come over. So she had had a watch. She had, had all this data in there. She was really into HealthKit. She lost her phone. It went in the sink or something. She went to go back up from her computer and none of that came out there. Wow. But that's something that's not very publicized. You know, people just, right. it's not something that's talked about. So keeping that data once you have it is also an important thing and something that I was like, oh, I hope I'm doing it the right way. And I was doing iCloud, so it's not an issue, but something to think about. Rich, I also had my band spontaneously re just reset. Uh, I left it on the charger for a day or two and yeah, complete factory reset all by itself. Have you heard of wow. anything? I haven't heard of that one, but what I have been hearing about is the whole battery issue that it will suddenly look like it doesn't have a charge, even though you just fully charged it. Mm, and so it'll suddenly that. start showing zero. No. Some no, people I came have back to, to return. It. Some people have had to do returns on them and send it back. I, I picked up the watch and it was at that point where you're picking where, where, what location you're at and what language it's in. And I'm like, yeah. oh, wait a minute. I'll, I'll admit it was a little dis discouraging to have to go back to because I'd put so much customization into yeah. it. And then I'm like, oh, God, I don't want to do that again. And I have not the Microsoft gone back. Health app should have that backup, I think. Uh, it should should have have a, a is there no backup down. for the band? Does it not, not back up at all? Not configuration. No, the data goes to the cloud eventually and goes to the health uh, dashboard. So, but the way you've got your phone, your band configured, whether it be customizations in colors, the number of tiles, what tiles and information like that, that information is not backed up anywhere. So when you, when it has to be reset, you've got to redo all that. Wow. But okay. So this creates, the Apple Watch creates a backup in iCloud. So as it attaches to your phone. So I did a yep. full factory restore because I had set some things up the way I didn't want to. I was like, okay, we're just going to nuke and pave this. And it was like, hey, do you want to restore from a backup? No, exactly. I didn't want to. But it's that like Windows 10 there. does. Windows yeah, 10 exactly like Windows the first 10 time does. to use the re to restore from a previous something else. Right. And the watch or watch the uh, the band should have that same basic functionality. I think it's a snapshot of how the band's configured, yeah. and it's already syncing it to your phone, so it'd be easy enough to do that. I would think so. Right, yeah, that's something that uh, I think they did upgrade add, for sure. Rich, hang tight. Mike, hang tight. Uh, we, okay. I got a few things I need to do on close. We're gonna wrap up the recorder part of the show. Then we'll, Rich, if you can stay around, we'll open up a seat. And if anybody wants to jump in and talk Windows with us, we, we got a Windows. Hey, we have two Windows MVPs uh, here. And then there's who's me. the other one? So, <laughs> oh, you are. Two. That's right. Your <laughs> Windows experience now. <laughs> and then there's me. So we, yeah. So uh, hang tight. I do want to go back. We had a, a listener email. This uh, actually came in a couple weeks ago. I wanted to read it out loud, though, to you guys, because it was something I said, and it's important that I get corrected on some of these things. So let me read it to you. So Jeff writes to us. He says, I listened to your podcast, Home Gadget Geeks, after finding it several months ago. It's one of the podcasts that helps me get through the workday, even when I'm doing some desk work. So Jeff, thanks for listening to us even when you're doing some desk work. Thank you for the hard work that you put into the show. That's all Mike Weger there. And uh, I have to say, I'm very excited about the Ring interview, which we're still trying to get settled. I had that for last Monday, and I oh, lost. And they it did a Windows work. app too. Yeah, they do. The Windows 10 app. Mm -hmm. So uh, he says, "Beyond praise, I'm emailing you because one of the recent shows you mentioned virtual reality only seeming to be a gaming option." Mike, do you remember when we talked about? Yeah, I was <laughs> guilty of that I said that in those exact words. I think it was me, not even you. Uh, I think I said it too. I said augmented reality is the more useful version, and right. uh, and virtual is really only for gaming. That's exactly what I said <laughs> in the show. I actually, he says, Jeff says, I actually just read an article about a doctor that use Google Cardboard, an iPhone, and a special app to best prepare for a rare surgery on a four-month-old in Miami. The doctor described using virtual reality and the challenges and bad luck that had led even to using, uh, using this new tool. I included the quote uh, and the link for the full story. He says in quotes, with Google Goggle, it is possible to move around and see the heart from every angle to almost be inside the heart checking out its structure, which is true, right? When we think about virtual reality from this standpoint, um, a Burke looked through the Google Cardboard and visualized what he could do uh, to fix this this patient's heart. And so the, I'll put the link to the full story in there. But, wow. you know, Mike, he's right in the sense that when we think of virtual reality from a 
from a, from a, uh, a medical standpoint or whatever, it's still though, it's still, I hate to say this, it's still an immersive gaming scenario, right? Where you're going in and going around. Now it's not gaming cause he's saving somebody's life. And right. so I appreciate that. So I, and Jeff, I know you're not correcting me, but I stand corrected. It's true. It's th those kinds of, uh, those kinds of applications are very viable. And, and that is one of those things when you think about, any kind of training, rich military training, right? Think about yeah. what the things we could do with virtual reality in a military sense that um, could maybe uh, would be better than an augmented reality standpoint. Yeah. So Jeff, they thanks showed, for- They talked about some of that at CES too. Trent Dilfer, I think, talked about it, use in the NFL in that they could put players into game situations in a virtual environment and have them make this, you know, like a quarterback. How would you read this defense? What would you change? You know, how would you change the play? So- I mean, I remember when telemedicine first came out in the Navy and where they could talk over the phone and send images over the phone that were like one every five or 10 seconds to help a doctor in the field, you know. So it, it, you remember the old uh, emergency TV show, mm -hmm, Jim? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And they would call in on the radio and talk to those guys over the radio, right, <laughs> yeah. about what was going on. Yeah. Um, so it, it each generation has its uniqueness when it comes to this kind of technology and how it can be used. And there's no doubt. I mean, look at HoloLens. Some of the and the early demo videos, they showed that, you know, a, a teacher teaching medical students biology and anatomy. And they had this virtual mm -hmm. uh, image in front of them that showed the different layers of the skin, the bone, you know. So there's tremendous amount. And. We're, oh, no, it was at Build last year that I got to do HoloLens, and I did the the CAD and the, the drafting, and I did the look at the wall kind of thing. But augmented reality, uh, they just got HoloLens up on Space Station, right? In the, the uh, I forget who it was. It wasn't uh, Dragon, but it wasn't SpaceX, but... Um, they now have HoloLens up there with the ability for them to connect with the ground. And look at what just happened with this spacewalk, right? They had a water leak in the helmet again of one of the spacewalkers last Friday. So they pulled them in early. They're doing research. They're checking everything. And they're able to share this data back and forth and all, by all rights. If they figure out a fix on the ground, Scott Kelly up there on the International Space Station 300 days today could put on a set of HoloLens with an engineer on the ground and they could walk him through exactly what to do and fix that suit mm -hmm. from afar from 250 yeah. miles it's 250 miles is not a long way except if it's up in directly <laughs> ahead of you <laughs> Unless so <you're> in space. <laughs> th that's where the augmented reality i think can come in now microsoft showed it off as a gaming platform too right back in october in new york they came on stage and had that guy had that thing on his hand and he was zapping whatever was crawling out of the walls and virtual reality if you were paying attention to cs i won't make mention but it's got a lot of uses, um, and but that's restrictive. Think about it. I cannot see outside of that environment. Right. So you have to be aware of where you're at, and so that can't be used in all situations in all yeah. cases. Yeah, yeah. No, right on. So Jeff Schiller, thanks for uh, sending in that. Now you can always send me if you have those kinds of that kind of feedback. Ted, who just took off, and I was going to mention Ted, and then he took off. Ted had sent me in. He said, "Hey, I listened to the five year show, and uh, excited to hear your show next week." That happened to be the week I was off, so. We said, oh, we said, hey, Ted, I, I sent him a note. Sorry, man, I'm in San Diego. He said, no problem. He came back tonight. But uh, I always appreciate those. And Ted, great to have you uh, out here listening tonight. I always appreciate that feedback that we get from you guys. So if you want to send me an email, love uh, love to get those from you. Uh, Jim at TheAverageGuy.tv is the best way to send it to me. You can find me on Twitter at Jay Collison. You can find uh, Mike over there at Uyghur Tech. Of course, you can get uh, Rich at WinOBS. That's me. And, uh, we we are all on Twitter quite a bit. So if you want to communicate with us through Twitter, that's one way to do it. If you ever got a Windows question, Rich is the guy yep. to ask. So you send can send them my those way. to him as well. want to let you know that the AverageGuy.tv platform, both web and media hosting, powered by Maple Grove Partners. That's, of course, you know that's Christian and get secure, reliable, high-speed hosting. From people you know and trust, for more information, visit Maple Grove Partners. That's just Maple Grove Partners, all one word, dot com. Uh, WordPress and uh, podcast hosting plans starting at 10 bucks. It's a pretty good deal. 10 bucks a month uh, for Christian. He'd love to set that up for you. I want to thank Roger over at WLMN Radio. Mike, are they up and running over at WLMN? Yes, is that, they're back is that actually break. Okay, they're good, good to go. So Roger is broadcasting us live on terrestrial radio out at uh, WLMN. In, what, this show? Yeah, this show. Yeah, wow, this show. I'm on, on the radio. Really? Rich, we're the big, we're in big time now. What's, um, hey, what's something that's, else? Man. Where's that at, Mike? 
Grafton, West Virginia. Grafton, West Very Virginia. Cool. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty so cool. So I want to thank Roger for doing that as well. Just a reminder that you can pick up and listen to the apps here. Uh, and listen through the apps. HomeGadgetGeeks.com is the way to do it. Don't forget to listen to the other podcasts as a part of the Geeks Network, thegeeksnetwork.com as well. And and I'll encourage you, go out and listen to Rich. Again, you, that's that's listen to both these guys. You should you can get Apple and you can get uh, Microsoft. Boom. You're you got everything you need. I guess you have to get it. We don't have a really solid Google uh, podcast, do we, Rich? And the geeks. Not I, I don't think there is anything Android or any of that thing. Yeah, yeah no. no, we need one of those. So if you're interested in starting and if you've got an Android or a Google podcast that you want to get involved, let me know. We'll get you hooked into Dave and uh, see if you can become a part of the Geeks Network. Doesn't cost you yeah. anything. We just want to not get a, you involved. Yeah. If you are shopping, I do want to say thanks for all the support you've given to the tech scholarship fund on the average guy you guys went crazy on cables right after christmas well i know what everybody got for christmas holy cow i just saw a ton of cables come through on the uh on the the amazon i, I can't see who did it of course but it does tell me what they buy through the average guy tech scholarship fund not if by you, name though yeah. i gotta say this when you say that you, you don't know by name who bought what so if, i don't know yeah. Very it's generic just general purchases. You get a list of purchases that were made. What yeah. they bought, but uh, man, there were a ton of cables in cool. this month's purchase. So a lot of people get new devices. And if you go out to the average guy.tv slash Amazon, that is the way to get to, to get in that. It'll automatically pick it up and we'll get some credit for that. Somebody Mark always mentions, yeah, what about Canada? Well, we have a Canadian link to the average guy.tv slash Amazon CA. Get you our link in. Uh, in Canada. All right. We are live every Thursday, most Thursdays. I take a couple Thursdays off a year to get it done, but we are live out here most Thursdays, 8 p.m. Central, 9 Eastern, out the average guy. TV slash live. Got some great interviews coming up for you here in the future. We're trying to get those guys from ring.com back. We got some guys from the network coming in. Lots of great tech. We'll have a very, very full spring for you. So I'm going to say get subscribed, get in here and get listened. Uh, listen to these guys' podcasts as well. And with that, if you're listening live, hang around. But with that, we'll say good night, everybody.